Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the DLT Continuous X podcast series hosted by myself, Jim Fitzmorris, Michael Fitzerka, and Rick Stewart from DLT. Today, we have the distinct pleasure to sit down and speak with our friends over at Dynatrace, who are true leaders and visionaries in the application performance monitoring space. Today, we'll discuss the critical role that Dynatrace plays within the DLT Secure Software Factory, the work they're doing in the public sector space, and to hear all things Dynatrace related with various topics we're excited to discuss. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Dynatrace team. Bob, would you like to kick things off from uh, introductions on your side? Sure, good morning, everyone. I'm Bob Dorch. I'm the uh, director of the federal civilian side of our um, government team, and I'm very, very pleased to be here. Good morning. I'll turn it over I'm to Steve. Good. I'm, I'm Steve Mazuka, and I'm Bob's counterpart. I lead the uh, defense and intelligence side of the business force. And good morning, everyone. My name is Willie Hicks. I lead the uh, federal sales engineering team um, and the manager over that group. Thanks guys, and, and really appreciate you guys doing this with us today. So let's get started. So Bob, I'm gonna ask you the first question here. So uh, big news recently uh, from you all, uh, you just celebrated your 10th straight year as a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for APM. Can you speak to the longevity and success that Dynatrace ex experienced over those 10 years? And, and why you continually, year over year, uh, are in that magic quadrant leader space? Sure, absolutely, Jim. You know, since uh, Gartner first started uh, releasing an APM magic quadrant, Dynatrace has been in that leader quadrant with uh, initially a second generation solution. But uh, five or six years ago, our senior management uh, tasked our engineering teams with coming up with uh, a vision for what the cloud would bring to the needs for an advanced or third generation APM solution. And I'm really pleased to say that with the introdu introduction of that solution about three years ago, uh, Dynatrace has taken on even more of a leadership position with an AI powered, you know, um, single executable based uh, agent deployment and a uh, highly automated solution that's actually furthered our lead in the APM uh, magic quadrant space. In fact, uh, just a couple, well, actually just last month, uh, a couple months ago, Gartner released their critical capabilities uh, study for what's important in an APM environment. And of the uh, six use cases that they identified out there, uh, uh, Dynatrace scored highest in five out of those six. And they included IT operations, uh, DevOps release, application support, um, uh, applications development, cloud app, cloud op, and cloud ops. Um, you know, and then last month, uh, a company called an organization called G2. Um, gave Dynatrace a number one ranking in all six of the categories of their spring grid reports that they report on. And, and those were AI ops platforms, uh, cloud infrastructure monitoring, container monitoring, which is increasingly important in the cloud, uh, digital experience monitoring, something we call session replay, which I think is, is unique to us. And then of course, application performance monitoring. So uh, we've been very blessed by being recognized by numerous different uh, industry analyst organizations as is obviously having a clear lead in the APM space. And, and Bob, and I'll even put this out to the, the rest of the team, you know, over the last few years, are there specific things that you guys point to when you're having those conversations with the, you know, whether it's the channel or an end agency customer um, that you guys really point to to say, hey, these are the really, you know, prior, in terms of high priority things that, that you attribute to that continued success from a Dynatrace standpoint? Uh, sure, I, I can try and take that one on as well. Uh, you know, when we're talking to, to customers and to partners, you know, the things that seem to resonate are, are areas like um, you know, speed to resolution, you know, the, again, the ability to auto instrument your applications truly from a true a full stack end to end and the ability to, to collect data uh, from every single transaction so that you're actually not you know, doing something like uh, sampling, which if you're trying to feed an AI engine, you know, the more data, the better, the better, you know, the, the, the resolution of the data, the easier it is to, for the AI to actually identify the true root cause 
the true root cause means that you start to eliminate the war rooms. And eliminating war rooms means that you free up those uh, agency personnel uh, for higher value tasks, you know, as such as the continuous migration from, of those applications from an on-prem environment to the cloud. So. Great, thanks, Bob. So let's pivot. So Rick, I'm going to ask you, um, you know, in the in the monologue opening here, uh, I had referenced the the key role that Dynatrace plays within the DLT Secure Software Factory. Can you speak to why they play such a critical role and, and why we um, you know looked at them and, and when they first approached working with DLT, uh, we were very excited about the opportunity to work with Bob and Steve and the team over there, uh, Willie and, and your technical team. Sure, uh, thanks Jim. And I think Bob touched on a lot of the um, aspects of why we chose Dynatrace. And, uh, and during this podcast, we'll allow to expand but to lay the kind of the groundwork, the real goal of the secure software factory, the reference architecture and the advisory of um, a, a DevSecOps culture really is to accelerate public sector agencies ability to um, their journey towards DevSecOps, which is primarily a cultural aspect, but it's also the mixture of people, processes and technology. So we're, what we're trying to do is evangelize technology providers that provide uh, uh, capabilities that allow um, public sector agencies to um, accelerate their ability to deploy their workloads, um, not only with high quality, but securely, um, and the ability to rectify any kind of defects as fast as possible. So given that kind of framework of what we're trying to achieve with the Secure Software Factory, uh, we looked at the various different um, uh, maturity levels within the public sector and you know, there's a wide range in the spectrum of immature in terms of uh, maybe mainframe-ish, more waterfall-ish approach to really agencies uh, that are embracing DevSecOps and automation and all these capabilities. So within that range, we wanted to provide a, an architecture that not only allows uh, mature um, agencies the ability to even get faster, but also a roadmap for other public sector, sector agencies that are not as mature to have a guideline, a, 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 a platform from which they can accelerate their ability. So um, given that, and if you got a Snickers, I've been, I, I tend to be a little bit verbose, grab your Snickers and eat a little bit. Um, but one of the things that um, we started off with, uh, Mike and I and the engineering team, was to look at a blank slate of a platform of how do we allow these various different maturity levels within the public sector to, to have a platform that we can stand behind and, um, and really say, we're trying to solve a lot of problems all at once. The primarily one is to get workloads out faster uh, with high quality. And in order to do that, we're embracing the notion of containers. Uh, containers gives the ability for agencies to um, containerize their workloads but what it also does is give them a wide range of uh, solutions in terms of application languages that they can choose from that, that allow them to complete their tasks as fast as possible with the best technology based on their understanding of the problem. And when you containerize it, it gives the ability for the um, operations folks to not have an additional task to support that type of technology. The containerization makes it uh, more like more or less a widget uh, for them to control and provide into their environments. Um, so uh, containerization allows ad development teams to have lots of different flexibility and choices in how they're solving their solutions. But when you're talking about containerization, you're talking about a platform of deployment, orchestration, and management that needs to allow those containers to be deployed across the wide range of infrastructure. Uh, whether that be on-prem, um, bare metal, uh, virtualized environments, uh, public or uh, private um, cloud environments. Uh, so we have to come to the agreement that a certified Kubernetes environment is a great platform from which we can advise agencies to move towards. Okay, so given all that kind of background with containerization, polyglot, um, uh, um, the move towards microservices architecture, which is very, very big. 
um, and a can, Kubernetes environment that allows these workloads to be deployed on various different infrastructure. Um, we look for an APM solution provider that could comport with those types of um, uh, table stakes. So uh, Dynatrace came first to mind. And the reason why I particularly love the Dynatrace approach is that um, they have embraced Kubernetes. They can embrace Kubernetes. They saw where the puck was going, refactored their platform to allow these workloads to be deployed um, ubiquitously without installing an agent in each one of the workloads, which again, hinders a development team's ability to deploy their software quicker because now they not only have to inject other technology into their workloads, which they may need not have an agent that can support a, a Go or some of the emerging languages, um, but they can um, also, when they inject an agent, they're, they're, they're injecting a potential attack vector from a security standpoint. So what Dynatrace does with their one agent, and I know we'll be talking about that a little bit um, further in this podcast, but the one agent allows the, um, the daemon or the service to run um, on a compute node within a Kubernetes cluster and allows observability into those workloads and deep tracing ability uh, for these workloads outside of the development team's um, uh, ability to inject agents to it. They can automatically, by deploying on the platform, have visibility and observability and uh, uh, telemetry into those, uh, not only the services themselves, but the exchanges between services, which again, at the end of the day, allows teams to troubleshoot faster. They can see the exchanges, they can see potential bottlenecks and defects within their, their workloads, but also the ability to, how, uh, to see and, um, and monitor, and with their use of AI, the ability to uh, quickly remedy any particular issues, not only from a security standpoint, but from a, um, um, a, a defect perspective. Um, and again, this all comports very nicely with the Secure Software Factory's mission, which is to accelerate the ability to get those workloads in a secure manner out to the end users where they can be useful. So I hope you enjoyed your Snickers. Um, anybody from the uh, Dynatrace team want to uh, elaborate on um, uh, that approach? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. So that that's that's yeah, great um um great segue there, Rick. And um and absolutely, we are we couldn't be more pleased that um the convergence of DLT with uh, with us because because you're absolutely right. When you look at why our our you know our founder and our leaders thought of this five years ago, so just. A couple things. First of all, our founder of the of, of Dynatrace is still with Dynatrace, unlike you know the, a lot of other customers when they move on. And he saw that as a as a as a paramount way to, to rearchitect our technology. That's a really tough mission. Rearchitect your technology, basically rearchitect the plane while you're still flying it. And then over the last last five years or three years, we've been able to upgrade and convert almost all of our customers to the new platform. So obviously, that speaks well to the fact that we're going in the right direction. What's interesting when you talk about Kubernetes and cloud is also the convergence of, uh, you know, I, we almost don't want to be pigeonholed as APM, as application performance monitoring space. The government still doesn't necessarily always realize that they, they need an APM tool because the idea is that we have the infrastructure network side of the house that's monitoring. We also have the, the integrators or, or service providers monitoring. So if you look at what's happening even in Gartner, They've converged application performance monitoring with infrastructure map monitoring, and they actually came out with a digital experience monitoring, not a magic quadrant yet, but really a market research paper in the fall. And we're a leader in that space as well. And really it's all coming together. It's delivery of the service, the services via the cloud, via Kubernetes, and how does a, mon a holistic monitoring approach affect, affect the landscape? And you're seeing that with some of the mergers and acquisitions and, and Dynatrace is poised to be the vendor right in the middle of all this. We see ourselves as as in the middle of this for the service provider, for the um, for the you know for the the government entity, and as well as if you know if you're if you're making an investment in Red Hat or any other kind of Kubernetes technology, you need to have a some sort of monitoring strategy built into it from the development from the ground up. And we're poised to really be the right vendor for that. So we couldn't be more excited to be partnered with you guys. And um, and we it just it's just it's just easy. You know, and we, I'll give you one quick example. Um, 
we have a gov- I had a government agency just a month ago. They came to us and wanted to start a trial on something, and we set up a you know proof of concept you know meeting on a Monday morning. We get to the Monday, the government agency had already downloaded the software over the weekend. They were already running the trial on their own. Um, that's just something that would but have been unheard of in my past life that anybody would be doing that without all of our engineers helping that. So. The fact is, within two days, they were up and running. They had it all running, and they they did a demo to their leadership without us and being on the phone. I mean, it was that easy to show value that we were just there to help guide them, but we didn't actually have to drive the plane. We just had to kind of give them a little bit of toolage to kind of instrument it. And, and hey, I, Steve, I, go ahead, Rick. Let me hop in. So you had mentioned, uh, you know, the, the challenges, right, when it comes to APM, and not every agency understands that they uh, they they need an APM tool, right? Can you talk about how do you guys overcome that that challenge, right? Of when an agency either doesn't realize they need something like an APM um, platform, or they're just unaware or, or using something that, that you guys can point to to say, hey, we can do a much better job. Well, I think what we do is, um, um, if they is we go in there and talk about the fact is, are you able to get visibility, observability of your services down to the end users? And the answer is typically not. So if we can, if we if we have to approach it from an infrastructure observability mode, the idea is, look, take a look at Dynatrace. Let's compare this to what you're doing now with your your legacy legacy technology. And if you can just instrument your your servers and your backend systems with the same level of granularity that you do with your infrastructure tools, but give that level of observability down to the end user, why wouldn't you want to do that? You don't necessarily need then and, and that is what a lot of customers are coming to is can we can we basically replace multiple technologies with one as opposed to we're an additional technology to add on top of their their monitoring stack, that becomes a much tougher sell because now they have to find additional right. budget. So being the um given the fact that we can do so many different things, allows government agencies to do more with less. Um, hey. You know, Steve, I'll jump in and just add to that real quickly. And, you know, a lot of my customers, you know, I'll, I'll ask them about their, their current tool set that they're using and what happens when they do have a, a performance problem. And I mentioned it earlier, but I think it's worth noting again, invariably they, they talk about the war room scenarios where the, uh, the dev team has their set of tools. The ops team has a set of tools. The business owners are scratching their heads and saying, I don't care you know, what the problem is, just get it fixed. And with Dynatrace, you know, you've got a common set of, of metrics that everybody can use. The problem resolution is, is almost instantaneous because of the uh, AI assistance that we provide. And it becomes a very compelling argument for you know, those uh, government agencies that are trying to accelerate their migration to the cloud to have a single source of truth that helps eliminate, you know, you know, the time that's wasted in war room scenarios. And I just wanted to dovetail on what, what Steve said when we, we launched um, the one agent within our environment uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, it was a amazingly easy um, documentation was great. And the ability and the amount of information that you get out of the box is truly kind of overwhelming. Like, from an application pers- uh, development perspective, I had everything that I needed in order to be very productive within seconds. So I just wanted to add that on as a as a kudos to you guys. You've 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 made it easier. Yeah, as a as a developer, I'm sure don't want I, I don't want to have to build everything to a unique agent that comes out. So then you can have installed one agent, and I don't have to interact with it, or I don't have to change my code to interact with it. The worst case scenario, um, I think that that that's definitely one part of the reason why we we chose that for Dynatrace for the uh, uh, for our factory. Um, but Bob, I, I I know you mentioned on it or, or touched on it earlier, and I wanted to kind of bring back to it that um, some of the elements that you think that Dynatrace uh, sets us apart sets you apart from your competition. Um, you would, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, again, I mean, it, it talk about, you know, ad- advanced observability, uh, you know, having that, you know, single pane of glass, you know, I hate using that term, but that, but kind of an overall view into what's going on across your entire application infrastructure. Uh, the continuous automation that we bring to the table of basically is table stakes, you know, then uh, the AI assistance with uh, our AI engine, which we affectionately call Davis. Um, the ability, you know, and it kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier, cross-team collaboration. You know, if you're all working from the same sheet of music, it's very much easier for you to, you know, work seamlessly together. And then, of course, you know, one of the big things is also that uh, end-user experience and the ability to um, bring business analytics 
into the into the entire picture so that you do have um, you know an, an idea as to uh, how the applications that you're migrating are positively impacting the agency's mission. Um, I, I, great point, Bob. I, I, you mentioned collaboration, which is kind of the essence, the ingredients of a DevSecOps um, organization is the ability for everyone to communicate on the same kind of level of information. So that bringing that together exactly. is, is very, very powerful when you're trying to change culture. Yes. Um, anybody want to follow up? Um, uh, Willie, I'm going to ask you, um, can you speak to the security aspect of not only APM, but observability and why it's important from a Dynatrace perspective? Yeah, uh, yes, definitely. And, and thank you for that, Rick. So, uh, first of all, I always like to start discussions about uh, application performance management and especially Dynatrace in a security. Um, when we start talking about security and the security framework with, you know, just making sure we understand the fact that Dynatrace is, you know, an APM solution. We are focused currently, at least where our primary focus is on APM. However, with that being said, I have... Often I have many conversations with um, developers, with security professionals, with DevSecOps teams about how uh, APM, how Dynatrace can enhance the, the overall um, capabilities of the DevSecOps team. So we've already established, we've talked a lot, um, and you guys have done a great, uh, um, had a great conversation about uh, really the DevOps um, mindset, about how we handle um, observability, our, our one agent technology that allows for the automation uh, um, instrumentation down to the individual node and to the code level and so forth. Now, when we started thinking about security, though, I like to focus on something we haven't talked about yet is uh, what we call our SmartScape technology. So what SmartScape is, is this ability to visualize your application. And actually, this is what the AI uses as part of its uh, uh, is deterministic tree. It's, it's uh, basically the, the tree that it walks to actually start understanding and isolating root cause. This dependency map, uh, this SmartScape, as we call it, is an automated, uh, very detailed um, uh, view into your application stack from the data center all the way to the desktop, all the way to the browser, to the mobile device, and kind of all the components in between. And what I have heard from many uh, security professionals in the, you know, in the civilian side and in the DOD side is one thing that they're lacking and one thing that would help kind of break down the walls when you start looking at DevSecOps, I, I often hear about kind of there, there are still sometimes walls in between these groups there. You know, you, you have security teams. They, they don't probably have as many people to work with. They don't understand a lot of the DevOps, you know, mindset. Then obviously the DevOps teams, they're trying to inject security earlier into um, the development cycle. But a lot of times they don't understand, you know, kind of a lot of the motivations and, and what's kind of driving security. So, so they're trying to tear down these walls. And one of the things that often comes up is that the security teams don't have situational awareness. They don't have, you know, really awareness of what is what the developers are really developing. What does the whole end to end flow look like? What does, you know, this one component, you know, how does it impact the rest of the application? Why that's important is because you know, when we're shifting left, when we're developing, uh, you know, um, running Dynatrace in the development and your pipeline and your CICD pipelines, and when you're doing your testing, it really is important for security to understand these flows, to understand how they're, you know, how everything interacts, because it really helps them um, really develop their, their plans and how they're going to protect the system. But also when you move and shift right into production, when there is a vulnerability, when, um, you know, unfortunately, there, there are going to be times when there's an attack, there's, you know, um, a vulnerability, something is, you know, inadvertently deployed into the system that is down level, it's, you know, it, it has a security hole. Well, then the question is, when you have to remediate that, when you pull it out of the um, environment, when you have to isolate it and run forensic analysis on it, a lot of times security doesn't have a risk matrix. They don't understand, they can't really understand what's the risk of doing this. Okay, yeah, we know we have to take this out. We know we have to isolate it, but what does it mean to the whole system? Are we about to bring the whole thing down? So this, this smartscape, this ability to see um, end to end and also isolate a component and then also really associate risk 
to um, what we're about to do, I think is very powerful. And a lot of our customers like to see that. Um, and this is, this, this is, I'll just say, this is not just things that I see from my customers and from prospects, but also I will say that our development, our lab see this as well. We understand the power of this and how we might be able to use this in the future. I'll, I'll kind of leave, leave it at that. That that's fabulous. I I think that in terms of like go relating it back to co- uh, collaboration, it sounds like we're also bringing security into the fold as well, and that that they can get to the same view at the pain, the same pane of glass. Is there, um, uh, Steve? Is there any other collaboration? Um, uh, can we can you expand on maybe the collaboration? Uh, um, further aspects. Sure, of sure. So Willie got into the, you know, the background of the why the technology, uh, you know, enables collaboration. But I think what we're also seeing that in, in real use, right, we're, we're, we're seeing in organizations where um, if you think about historic, you know, back to historic application monitoring spaces, typically organizations would instrument an application only in production and only after that application calls a major outage, right? You, you, know, you think of the historic problems like healthcare.gov and some of the other major VA apps, and you think now it's time to instrument and figure out what went wrong with testing. And, um, and that's where, where, we, where we're seeing a shift, a mind shift, though, is we're being used in a number of areas. And in a couple of major DOD organizations, we're being used actually in the testing phase. So in conjunction with LoadRunner for you know, every application that passes through an enterprise test organization, they're applying Dynatrace to look for root cause analysis of problems before they go to production. Um, and with that, they're also now pushing that downstream into the development community saying, look, don't wait till you ship the code over to us for integration performance tests, but actually embed it in, into your development code because it runs in conjunction with, with CloudBees, with Jenkins, with, you know, with Ansible to really automate that process of discovery like Willie talked about and collaboration from from jump street and then it's just a natural migration from the development community into the enterprise test community into production and again whether that production be in a cloud environment whether it be like um in a in a platform container environment when you think about like platform one and the air force there's a number of different areas where we're just going to naturally fit into these these areas and um and it does it does ultimately provide a better service delivery to the warfighter or to the citizen if the organization thinks about this from a holistic view. So we look at us as the technology is already enabled to do that. And then really our mission as an organization is how do we enable the, um, the from the policy end at the top of the organization down to the practitioner level across the board. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so there's been a big paradigm shift here now for a while um, centered around the, the trend to the cloud as well as containerization. Uh, and, and similar before we kicked off this, this recording, guys, I know there was a recent article within the last few days, Willie, that we were talking about um, that's relative to containerization in, in Kubernetes. Um, how has Dynatrace embraced those things? So I'll, I'll start with that and, and allow my colleagues to also add to it. So uh, Dynatrace, that, so containerization, microservices, uh, this whole cloud conversation we're having, this is, this is where Dynatrace centers. Yes, we can look at your legacy environments. We can give you insight uh, um, across the, the application delivery chain. But when it really, the power really starts to show itself when you start talking about um, having to instrument, you know, going from a monolith to a microservices environment where you might have had a few application servers, databases, and so forth, and now you have hundreds or thousands of microservices you've got to um, uh, to to care for. You've got all of these containers. You've got running in different, um, you know, private cloud and in public and in your data center. So the complexity is just um, exponential. So as you're you know, although you're getting all these benefits from microservices, you're adding a lot of complexity to uh, this model. So Dynatrace really, um, this is why we re-architected ourselves. This is why we, you know, understood we had to change our model because we had to be able to to really attack and instrument these automatic. We had to add automation throughout the product. And that's what we've done. The automation um, from a container standpoint, the automation from 
uh, uh, platform standpoint, but also, you know, we have, we're continuing to double down on, on this. So, you know, I think as we were talking about earlier with uh, Kubernetes, we just released an, um, uh, an announcement that we are really doubling down on our infrastructure level views of, you know, Kubernetes. And um, so giving you even deeper and more rich uh, depth and breadth of uh, insight at the container level, at the node level, at the cluster level. All of this data is not just sitting there, uh, as Bob pointed out, I do hate a uh, single pane of glass too, but, but it's true. We're, we're not just putting data on glass. We are consuming this data. We are using, our AI is now ingesting this data. It is, is um, um, crunching the numbers to understand when there's a problem. Is it the application? Is it the infrastructure? Is it, you know, something in a particular node? Is it a configuration issue? All of this is actually being analyzed um, for root cause. And, and I also just like to, to um, expand just a little bit on how this is being done. The AI that is at the heart of Dynatrace, uh, it is purpose built for this mission. You know, it wasn't an add-on. It wasn't something we just tacked on because we needed, you know, to stay in the magic quadrant or whatever. We actually built this at the heart of the system and everything else is built around it because it is that important. Um, you know, I think somebody joked earlier, yes, we marketing, you know, gave it a face. There's a, you know, a person, an actor who kind of does some, you know, um, some voicing and all around it. But at the heart of it, it is a deterministic AI, um, very powerful and in the same vein as using the same type of not, um, technology that you would see like at NASA and F, um, FAA, they're using very similar types of um, um, algorithms to do their analysis for, I would say probably far more, you know, um, you know, life and limb type of things. You think of NASA, you think of uh, things like, you know, keeping um, satellites in orbit and so forth, but Dynatrace is using that same um, type of technology. Bob. You well, want to well, add to the I, I, containerization, yeah, please? I, I do. I do kind of want to, you know, one of the things I think that uh, um, we kind of overlook and take for granted is that Dynatrace was also developed as a very extensible platform. You know, we've got um, APIs, you know, the built-in to interface with, with just about any, any uh, other product out there that you may be using, whether it's feeding information into service now for both trouble ticket um, generation or for maintaining the currency of a CMDB. Um, if if uh, your Splunk team needs data, a data feed, we can provide that consolidated feed. And the fact that we're also pulling in metrics from non-traditional devices uh, you know, that are more infrastructure oriented, as Willie pointed out, things like F5 load balancers or a Citrix um, environment, you know, we're able to ingest data from all of those. And, and again, the, the, the greater the amount of data from more disparate sources that we can use to um, populate the AI engine, the higher fidelity of the, uh, the root cause determination that we're going to be able to provide. And that high fidelity and high confidence in that root cause also allows us to uh, work with some open source, you know, and consortiums like uh, open telemetry, uh, where we're supporting uh, autonomous cloud enablement, which is basically the auto remediation of easily identified or, or clearly defined um, problems uh, using tools like Ansible Tower so that, you know, there's no human intervention involved in that, which I think really speaks to accelerating that time to value for our customers. Thanks, Bob. Steve, did you want to add anything to that? And if not, no worries. Um, so the, the only thing I wanted to add there was, um, was really focused on the, um, on the um, um, the kind of the the when I think about the where the AI engine can go and what how that benefits the government from a service provider standpoint, think about well, what I've seen a trend lately is um, some of the major major organizations are they're outsourcing a broad swath of 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 basic enterprise IT right. You think about there's programs called like enterprise IT as a service and there's programs like that across the board that are popping out of agencies. And the idea is, can I get all of the core non-mission critical IT services into one basic platform? And historically, would a, an integrator, obviously that's going to be outsourced from an integrator, would an integrator have brought in a either a series of tools from other vendors or would have tried to build some sort of collaboration suite themselves? 
And we're being brought in a number of those efforts because honestly, it's, it's the idea. It's one, it's one single platform and it's going to give them visibility across their network, across their systems, across their servers, and then obviously down to the end services. So the idea is, can I, can I enable one simple platform, build it into a, um, not only a simple to use model, but a simple cost model for how do I deploy and, and, and access these services, even down to potentially to the endpoints. So beyond just this delivery of the service applications and what, what both Bob and Willie have said is the only way you can provide that high level of service is if you're ingesting all the data from those endpoints, from the different services so that you can actually provide some sort of level of, um, of root calls. And the idea is not just to have alert storm where you're alerting everyone and there's an outage and then everyone's getting together, but can I pinpoint where the outage is and, and exactly who it's affecting? And that's, what's really, really interesting and fun is, when we, when we look to this service is down or slow and it's impacting this number of services, this many, this many people and this many applications really does help um, help desk teams and trouble teams determine the, the severity of the outage. Um, and that's something that typically just agencies or even commercial entities can't, can't see, could not see until now. So we couldn't be more excited about that. Um, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see where this, will this go is it right as, 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 as we go forward. Yeah, a slow service is almost more insidious than an outage. An outage, you can tell it's out. <laughs> when it's just responding slow or difficult, that's, a, that's even worse, and that's, a, that's better to identify. That's um, true, because otherwise, right, historically, it's blame the network. Well, <laughs> perhaps it's, you know, perhaps it's a network, <laughs> but everything can't be, everything, everyone can't be blamed on the three big telcos. So maybe it's not just the network. Right. right. True, true. Um, looking forward to the future, um, uh, do you? Um, I'll t- I'll ask Willie, engineer to engineer. Um, you know what? Uh, what do you see as the future? I mean, I, I've heard Rick mention a couple times that um, he thinks the multi-cloud, the hybrid cloud, where not just where you have one cloud, but where you you're using AWS and and Google and and and, and then you know whoever's offering the lowest price today, you switch from one to the other and move all your workloads to kind of control price that way. Um, that's uh, something that he sees with a with a hybrid multi cloud. What are you guys uh, looking at in the future? Yeah, so so I definitely see that that um, in the for- uh, I'm going to say I can't. Obviously, I'm not a, a fortune teller, but for the foreseeable future, uh, yeah, I am. I stayed a holiday. That, that, that's Rick's. <laughs> oh, he's not. Yeah. <laughs> But no, seriously. Uh, but the hybrid cloud, you know, when I when I think of hybrid cloud, so I'm thinking, you know, of uh, kind of what you just described. It's really a system architecture that um, you know has this workload portability. It has. Uh, we've got an orchestration layer that we're working with. Um, you know, there's management across these different environments, and um, and you know, that could be in the private data center, your, your public clouds, you know, we see it in, you know, moving into the the mill cloud and cloud one and all these different um, uh, environments, past environments and so forth. Uh, And I don't see that changing any time in the near future because I I see very few agencies that are just moving everything to the cloud. It's just a, a, just a straight migration. There is this bridge hybrid is going to be that bridge for some time because you do have, um, you know, and I work with a, a lot of groups that, you know, they've got um, legacy apps that they just can't move. They can't get rid of them, but they, they just can't move them. Uh, there might be security or regulatory concerns that, you know, these have to stay within this, this boundary. And, you know, we can move these workloads, but this workload has to stay for some reason. So, you know, I, I, I'm going to say for the foreseeable future, this is going to be the, the norm. And um, t- to be honest, uh, it's, it might be inevitable, but the beauty of Dynatrace and our platform is that we really don't care. We're, we're agnostic and, and we can see across all of these boundaries. So I, I mentioned earlier the smart state. You know, that's again where that power comes in because we don't care if, um, uh, you know, a system is partly running in, you know, your data center, part of the services are running up in AWS, maybe some are running in Azure, some are running in OpenShift, some are running in a private cloud somewhere, some might not be in your control at all. You might have data that's sitting, you know, in another agency that you're just referencing, you have to, to make calls out to. We actually don't 
care about any of that. We can see that complete end to end across all those boundaries tied together into a complete picture and even give you visualization into calls that are being made to things outside of your control. You know, I might be, you know, I might have to make calls out to this agency to pull data down. And, you know, I've isolated the problem down. I've looked and looked and looked and there's nothing in our environment is actually the problem lies in this other agency. And we can see the calls coming down. We might, it might be a black box to us, but we can still see that that is where uh, the problem lies. So, so that, and also being able to wrap into that data um, because we are in this hybrid environment, you know, being able to bring in telemetry from those environments themselves, you know, CloudWatch, bringing um, CloudWatch data in from AWS, monitoring data in from Azure, uh, data points from, you know, the past environments you might be running in, like we were mentioning OpenShift and so forth. All of this data is being ingested. And that's one thing I will say about our, our platform, we love data. We don't shy away from it. The more you can pump into us, the, the richer our data set is, the more accurate our predictions are, the more accurate our root cause analysis is. You know, so, you know, we don't, we're, we're looking at all transactions, all infrastructure components and so forth. And we can scale to that. We can scale to, you know, a few, you know, hundred microservices to, um, you know, hundreds of thousands and, and bring all that data in and process it. So, to answer your question, uh, I definitely that's where we see uh, the um, that's where we see the foreseeable future, and that's why that you you talked about we talked about this doubling down of um, our um, visibility into these environments, into Kubernetes, into OpenShift, into AWS, uh, and so forth, because this is this is where things are going. We see that we that we built the platform for that reason. And um, I'd like to dovetail on that, Willie, and I asked Steve. Um, uh, in the public sector with the amount of contractors and systems integrators, and you kind of touched on that um, a few minutes ago, and with these loud, uh, large cloud migration efforts um, where you have multiple SIs, can you speak to the AI capabilities that Dynatrace offers and how it can uh, facilitate or foster a better outcome or solution in these um, migration efforts? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm really excited for this. So I wanted to kind of cover this on two ends. One is, like I said, with the um, with the AI assistance, and we don't want to say we're an AI RPA engine. You know, we're not we're not trying to play in that world. But we feel that um, you can't be a holistic monitoring solution without an artificial intelligence. And you will see this because you're seeing that other um, other folks in this field are trying to invest in this other kind of technology. But we we just have a, a you know multi years long head start, and it's got to be embedded into the platform. The auto discovery of all the dependency mapping is really the key. And that does two things. One is by automatically de de dependency mapping, it, it enables the government agency and the integrator to realize all the, all the other components, which they typically don't know, especially for any legacy applications, because there's been multiple contractors over the years that that application's impacted. And it adds to the security component. What we're really excited about is, so our founder, Berm, actually, um, hinted to this. So our, our last customer, large customer show was called Perform, and it was back in January. So it was right before the whole COVID crisis. So it was still in person. And he hinted at the end of the show about where we're going in the security space. And we, and for me in the, in the mission DOD Intel side, I couldn't be more excited about that. When you think about what a SIM does and what an application performance monitoring space can do, you see the convergence there and saying, well, if I can automatically discover and map all the critical dependencies in application, I can also detect any kind of anomaly, whether it be service degradation that's impacting the service or whether it's some sort of threat anomaly coming into the application. And that, um, that will only become, that'll only make our, our technology even more critical. So stay tuned to see where we where we launch to this space. We see ourselves within the next, you know, six to 12 months, really being more critical on that space and being able to go address the the SOC side of the house as opposed to also in the, in the NOC side of the house. And um, and we'll, we think we'll be the first vendor to really, to really converge those areas. So uh, that being said, guys, round table question for the Dynatrace team. So um, two prong question. So individually, we'll, Steve, we'll start with you here. Uh, you had the baton. So what does the future hold in your mind at Dynatrace? And what personally excites you the most over the next few years uh, in terms of what you're seeing? So back to the, what excites me the most is, is the convergence of the development with security with ops. So the idea that if I'm going to be critical 
you know, if we're going to help, if we're going to help our mission partners, and it's particularly in the DoD and Intel side, while they do care about monitoring their their back office IT, you know, situations, obviously we want to be able to help instrument SAP and the other critical business applications. What really excites me, and where we're really going to grow and become potentially standardization approaches, is if we can help the armed forces both on the mission side and on the IT side. And I think the the only way we can do that is if we can easily instrument any number of platforms, regardless of whether it's Kubernetes or whether it's Java or whether it's Python or anything else, or, and can we quickly and enable folks in the different in the different swim lanes between development and operation. So to me, that's the most exciting side that when they come to us with a challenge and we go, sure, we can do that. We can, you know, we, we want, you want to instrument the endpoint? You want to understand printers on the network? Sure, we can, why not, right? The answer should be, sure, why not? And if we don't have it in the built in capability today, it's a very easy um, API build, and it's a fairly, you know, fairly easy turnaround. So that's the that's a great thing is that it's not a let's go talk to development and maybe we'll build it in two years, but we can add this we can add virtually any capability into our platform very very easily, which we're really excited about. Bob, you know, let me let me expound. Yeah, I'll say let me expound on that. You know, uh, Steve started to touch upon it. You know, we use a, a no ops approach to uh, application or our own internal code development. So we're in our SaaS environment, we're actually releasing code to production 26 times a year. That's every other week. Uh, something else that really excites me is that we have currently have three and soon to be a fourth flavor, if you will, of Dynatrace for deployment. We have our, our commercial SaaS offering, which we see you know, a tremendous acceptance for in, in the uh, commercial retail type spaces. Uh, we offer something called Dynatrace Managed, which is essentially that SaaS offering, but for your own on-prem or private cloud deployment. Um, a third flavor is, we call, is something we call managed offline, which is totally air-gapped from the internet. That's uh, become increasingly important for our DOD and IC customers and some other higher security environments. And then you know, what I'm really excited about is that uh, the company made a commitment to uh, developing and deploying a FedRAMP offering of Dynatrace. And uh, you know, we have our agency sponsor. We have the agency ATO at this point. We expect in the next week or so, to get our full FedRAMP uh, authorization at the at the uh, moderate level. So, from a DevSecOps uh, perspective, you know, being able to offer um, our customers and your customers and secure, secure software factory multiple uh, modes of deployment, including a FedRAMP moderate offering, uh, I think is, is really going to accelerate the adoption of Dynatrace across the entire you know, federal civilian environment, in particular, from my perspective. Kudos, nice, very good. So, uh, yes, I, with everything that Steve and Bob said, 100% agree, um, and um, they're, they're pretty much reading my mind. I would say, to, just to add a little bit to that, you know, what I, where I see um, Dynatrace um, and our, our, our development and PM organization moving in, and again, not being a PM, not being able to read all the tea leaves, but I, I do understand and see how we are continuing to double down in, like I mentioned earlier, the cloud space, uh, in um, things like what you saw with the announcement of Kubernetes, this idea of, you know, even increasing more our visibility from an infrastructure standpoint, something we like to kind of call infrastructure 2.0, giving more, even more insight, uh, more ease of, of instrumentation of, of devices that are not just uh, um, host-based. So, you know, maybe having the advent of, you know, within the product, almost like a, a store type environment where you can go in and just pick, you know, um, not only do I have these hosts out here and these other components, but, you know, I have this this switch or this router or this, um, you know, F5 load balancer and, you know, click of a button, you start to get insight and light up the picture even more. So those are the kinds of things that are continuing to innovate. And what keeps me just, uh, you know, so motivated to work at Dynatrace and I've been here uh, 10 plus years um, and in this environment, you know, um, in IT, that's that's probably a Forever. pretty long time. Um, that's a lifetime. That is a lifetime. And, and what really keeps me here is that I never get bored. You know, we are always, and that's the thing with, with um, people who are in technology and people, developers and engineers and so forth. I want to keep my, I want to keep myself fresh. I want to, you know, be with the, the newest technology. I want to learn the newest stuff, but I also want to be working for a company that is bringing to the market um, really fresh, really new um, tech. And that's what we see at Dynatrace. You know, our, we, when I started here, we were releasing code pretty much twice a year. Mm -hmm. Now, 
every two weeks, um, I am reading the internal notes because I have to keep up on what we're releasing. And, and it's almost embarrassing to say sometimes that I'll go into a call, I'll go into a demo, and I'm like not trying to look surprised in front of the customer because something new has just popped up on them. <laughs> on I'm like, oh, no, I, I didn't even know that was there <laughs> yet. And so, you know, I often have to like look at the demo environment before I actually do a demo just to make sure, you know, they haven't released something that I wasn't aware of yet. So, so that's what actually keeps me here and that kind of um, investment. I, I mean, I, I can see, I see that continuing. We, we're not going to slow that down. We're just going to double down and continue to bring the features and functionality that our customers demand. That's terrific. That's yeah. really nice to hear. Um, you guys are all excited. Um, so we've entered into the lightning round portion of our uh, podcast with, um, <laughs> and this is kind of a, a fun thing that uh, Jim, Mike, and I do. Um, we, we see, um, uh, kind of a religious battle between the industry on 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 naming conventions of cultures. So, um, real quickly, and I'll start with Bob, and then I'll go to Steve, and then Willie. Um, your preference on the the terminology and nomenclature: DevOps or DevSecOps, or other? Well, from my perspective, you know, I think the security should be built in from the beginning. So, in, in my mind there really is no difference between DevOps and DevSecOps. They, they should be synonymous. So, you know, I say it doesn't matter. It's, it's security is always built in. Understood. Steve? And I, I think, yeah, I think the, in DOD, you see, yeah, you see definitely DevSecOps all the time. And we, we talked to MITRE and we talked to our integrator friends. We talk, they, they definitely went there. So back to what I was saying, I, yeah, I'm so glad that we are investing very heavily in that forum so that we can not just say it as a buzzword and put it on our slides, but actually show in demos and in use cases where we can actually impact that area. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for the, the new conversion because I think it just, it just enhances our capability. All right, Willie. Yeah, same here. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this and at first I was thinking, I really don't have a, a, a dog in the hunt on this because, you know, it, 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 you know, in my mind, you know, DevSecOps security should be built in um, from the beginning, but I just started thinking about how does this impact me as an individual, as a citizen, as a constituent. And, you know, I don't want the, you know, my, my most critical information, you know, you know, my social security information, my, my, uh, all of my um, tax information and so forth. I don't want it on insecure systems. I've been, I've seen enough things in the Washington Post that, that <laughs> get me killed about where my, my data might be. So, sure. you know, I think it is imperative that, every agency really starts to to shift the security idea left because if they don't they're going to continue to compromise the the citizens you know most precious information so in my mind DevSecOps all the way well thank you for guys for weighing in thanks guys so uh how we end every episode of this podcast series uh in, in along the lines of what rick was saying is um, it's a play off of the name, the Continuous X uh, podcast series. Uh, and Willie, I want to give you a shout out here. The, the question prior to this, uh, I heard you say two or three times continuous or continually. So appreciate the, uh, the, the, the props there, yeah. of, you know, promoting <laughs> the, the name. placement. <laughs> yes. Uh, his subconscious coming out there. Thanks, Willie. Um, so what we like to do is ask each, each one of you here, um, if you could continually do one thing, what would it be? And it can be anything. Steve, we'll start with you. And keep it clean, Steve. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to me, I think, um, I, really it's about the continually um, instrument the application, right? I think the, the unknown of what the critical dependencies are in large scale, whether it be mission critical or business applications is fundamental. The fact that we can auto instrument continually upgrade, update that with things that with new new additions to the environment is really the most important function about continually. So I'm gonna pause, take a time out there. So Steve, non-work related, let's go <laughs> If you could do continually do one thing. Uh, a, a prior episode, somebody put out they would continually have a cup of coffee in front of them. Uh, so having fun. Ooh, we like to have fun with this. So, Steve, I'm going to put you back on the spot. Personally, if you could do one thing continually, what would it be? Well, for me, it would be con continuously um, take care of my yard work. I have a, um, I have a tree line yard. We have chickens back here. We have weeds grown out of control. So someone to do continuous yard work would be a very, very fundamental. That, good answer. That, that's Rick. Yeah. 
uh, was out on his lawn. <laughs> I, I love the chickens bed, Steve. Fresh eggs. Yeah. That's uh, that, fresh eggs. It's perfect timing oh. for COVID. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect. Bob. Wow. You know, I think Steve and I are cut from the same cloth. I, there's never any end to to my yard work, and uh, I find some you know some peace and relaxation with it, even though. Uh, it seems like at the end of every weekend, I'm exhausted and, and looking forward to getting back to work. <laughs> Excellent. And Willie, we'll end with you. All right. So for me, I will tell you, and you might be able to tell from the gray in my beard here. Uh, I have, I love my family. I love my children. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And if I could continually get sleep for it, like, <laughs> I could continually sleep for like an hour during, during this pandemic, I would just take sleep for <laughs> for, for a the answer. Of time. That's correct. Right. The answer. That's great. Well, hey, uh, Willie, Steve, Bob, uh, really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day today to speak with Mike, Rick, and myself. Uh, look very forward to um, supporting the Dynatrace team, uh, and, and look forward to the future with you guys. Uh, we're very excited about the relationship and. Uh, again, thank you very much for participating in the Continuous X podcast. Thank you for having me. And Jen, uh, Mike, and, and, yeah, and, and, and uh, Rick, thank you again for allowing us to participate. Thanks, guys. Great episode.